Blessed be our God, forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance, beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them, they shall see, and that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew, grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering, and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. For he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we, like strict sheep, have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked, and his tomb with the rich. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you see his life an offering for sin, he, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall see satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. The Holy Spirit testifies, saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley <clears throat> to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, <coughs> knowing, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> then Jesus, knowing <coughs> all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, 
they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it, warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them, and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I've always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I've said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? 
After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him. But you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was abandoned. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was a day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, here is your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, shall I crucify your king? And the chief priests answered, we have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but this man said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture said, that they divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. 
After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the others who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified. And in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We teach our children the stories of history, the good, the bad, and the ugly, so that they will learn what atrocities humanity is capable of committing and never do it again. We want to prevent ourselves and our children from making the same mistakes of the past. We want to be better, to treat others with love and compassion, and not to be guilty of the sins of the past. There's a depravity in human nature that makes us all capable of doing terrible things to others under the right conditions, whether it be social pressure, mob mentality, threats to our own safety or the safety of those we love, or orders and threats from those in authority. People in these situations have done things they would never have dreamed they would be capable of, things that would have horrified them if they were to have their eyes open to what they were doing. Can we be so sure we would not have run when the soldiers came to arrest Jesus? Would we not have gone along with the corrupt Jewish priests who governed the people and told us this man was actually opposing God? If we were Pilate, would we have been willing to stand up to the blackmail of the priests who threatened to turn him into Caesar as one who not only was failing to keep the peace, but was defending one who was leading a potential revolt. How much can we trust our moral integrity to stand up against threat 
without having really been tested, without being truly committed to honor the way of Christ even unto death, under those conditions, we too might be counted among the betrayers, those who denied Christ, those who even participated in the physical and emotional torture of Jesus. Indeed, there have certainly been so many times when we've unwittingly done so in what may have seemed to be small ways without even being aware of what we're doing. It's not an issue of race or creed. It's something we are all vulnerable to in our fallen, sinful human nature. When Jesus left the upper room where he'd shared a Passover meal with his disciples to go to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, they walked through the Kidron Valley. It was the same route David had taken centuries before when he was forced to flee Jerusalem because of the betrayal of his son Absalom. His own son had betrayed him and sought his death. Jesus had just been betrayed unto death by one of his closest disciples. David went up to the Mount of Olives weeping. Jesus, at the very least, would have been weeping in his heart, and he would weep tears of blood in the garden. His followers would betray, deny, and abandon him. The chief priests and religious authorities who were meant to lead the people to God were now seeking to put to death God-made flesh. The powerful Roman government who was meant to protect them and keep the peace was unwilling to stand up to corruption and to reveal the truth and uphold justice. All that was of the world had failed. What we see in the garden and throughout the mock trial, the suffering and death of Jesus, is not the defeat of the Son of God by the powers of this world, but the very real power of God being intentionally set aside to suffer and die on our behalf. Even Jesus' enemies knew he was powerful and they weren't taking any chances. John tells us that Judas arrived with a detachment of soldiers along with the police from the chief priests and the Pharisees. A detachment of soldiers is a huge number, up to as many as five or 600 men, and they came armed to arrest Jesus. Yet even in those numbers, when Jesus answered their search for Jesus of Nazareth, saying, I am he, speaking the name of God given to Moses, I am, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Six hundred armed men. He's in control every step of the way. He tells the, the soldiers to let the disciples go. He responds to Peter's impetuous act of cutting off the ear of Malchus by healing him. Jesus is in control of what's going on even as he is being arrested. No one else will be hurt in the process. No one else will be inhibited from hearing and understanding the good news because they have been a casualty along the way. The Aramaic word for of Nazareth means victorious one or of a powerful family. Jesus will be the victor even though it won't be apparent at first and it won't be the way that we will have anticipated. No torture the soldiers could use was able to make Jesus cry out or beg for mercy. He took it all with silence. Even though they used 
the whip that was nicknamed the scorpion because the leather was laced with pieces of metal and bone designed to tear the flesh and sinews from the bone, leaving only enough life in the victim for them to still be crucified. He refused to answer Pilate to defend himself. He knew it was the Father's will for him to be crucified, to pay the price for the sins of the world, and to restore the relationship between God and his people. He loved us so much that even in the face of our betrayal, even in the face of our denial, our cruelty, and our failure to love him as he loves us, he died for us. When Jesus was hung on the cross, a sign was put above him that said in three languages, in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek, so that all would be able to read it, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. It was a Roman practice to write the crime of the person being crucified on a placard and either hang it around their neck or put it on the cross as a warning to others who might commit the same crime. It was a practice also of the people in that time to notice acrostics, what the first letter of each word spelled out. What the priests and Pharisees were so upset about when they saw this sign and the reason they wanted it changed is because in Hebrew, the first letters of Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, spell out the name of God. Y-H-W-H, or B-H, in English. The name Yahweh, or Jehovah, was always spelled this way. They left out the, verb, the verbs in the word as a way of showing respect for God and not writing the full name. So essentially, Pilate had, without realizing it, identified Jesus as God. This was the one thing Pilate remained firm on. He would not change what he had written. And so the first line on that placard said, God. John tells us that at the same time as Jesus hung on the cross, the lambs were being slaughtered for the Passover. Jesus was the Lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice to pay the price of the sins of the world. God made flesh had himself paid the price to redeem us. When Jesus hung on the cross with the sins of the world upon his shoulders, blocking out the light and the sense of God with him, Jesus, who was himself the water of life, the fountain of living water, cried out, I thirst. For the first time, he was without the presence of God in his hour of greatest need. The soldiers used a branch of hyssop to reach up to him with a sponge of sour wine. The hyssop branch was used to put the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of the Hebrews in Egypt on the night of the Passover so that the angel of death would pass over them. Hyssop was also used to sprinkle blood and water on lepers and the ceremonially unclean so that they might be made clean again. Jesus, his sacrifice, would make all who called upon his name clean. And so at that point, Jesus said, it is finished. It is complete. He had loved us even unto death. He had been faithful in the work the Father had given him to do to the very end. The Holy One, God in the flesh, who was rejected, scorned, and abused by humanity, has demonstrated to us what real love looks like. Real love, the love of God, doesn't just love those who are easy to love those who love us and are kind and good to us. The love of Christ is one that loves in spite of the abuse 
and mistreatment of others. Even then, he gave himself for us. He died that we might live. We need to know this story deep within ourselves and realize that we are complicit in the crucifixion. This life-giving salvation can only be experienced when we first realize our need for a savior and repent of our sins. It's only in realizing the magnitude of our sin that we are able to realize the magnitude of God's great love for us. Even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In our Monday Thursday service yesterday, we sang the hymn, Ah, Holy Jesus, reminding us as we sang the words ourselves, not only that he died for us, but that it was our sin that put him there. Who was the guilty? Who brought this upon thee? Alas, my treason, Jesus, hath undone thee. Twas I, Lord Jesus, I it was denied thee. I crucified thee. Amen.
Dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent his Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, that all who believe in him might be delivered from the power of sin and death and become heirs with him of everlasting life. We pray, therefore, for people everywhere according to their needs. Let us pray for the Holy Catholic Church of Christ throughout the world that God will confirm his church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, re receive our supplication and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth and for those in authority among them, that by God's help they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Almighty God, kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace, and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that in tranquility your dominion may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind that God in his mercy will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of his love and stir up in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer, let the cry of those in misery and need come to you that they may find your mercy present with them in all their afflictions. And give us, we pray, the strength to serve them for the sake of him who suffered for us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all who have not received the gospel of Christ, that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Merciful God, creator of all the peoples of the earth and lover of souls, have compassion on all who do not know you as you are revealed in your Son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray, that there may be one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us commit ourselves to our God and pray for the grace of a holy life, that with all who have departed this world and have died in the peace of Christ, and those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of the joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.
We glory in your cross, O Lord, and praise and glorify your holy resurrection. For by virtue of your cross, joy has come to the whole world. May God be merciful to us and bless us. Show us the light of his countenance and come to us. Let your ways be known upon earth, your saving health among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. We glory in your cross, O Lord, and praise and glorify your holy resurrection. For by virtue of your cross, joy has come to the whole world. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. If we have died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. O Savior of the world, who by thy cross and precious blood hast redeemed us, save us and help us, we humbly beseech thee.
turning to page 360. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. And now, saying together the words our Lord Jesus taught us, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving.
using the prayer at the bottom of page 282. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls, now and in the hour of our death. Give mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest to the dead, to your holy church, peace and concord, and to us sinners, everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign, one God, now and forever. 